start with Paul, he's here right next to me, and uh, has his uh, 25 or so sounds up here. And just, um, if you could just maybe tell a little bit about, um, you know, where, the, what the inspiration for these sounds were, and a little bit about uh, what it was like for you um, sort of soaking in these, um, you know, these influences in the, uh, in the, the early days that you helped shape of, uh, of the, the electronic dance revolution as we, as we know it from, I don't want to get too high flown, so basically, hey, let's uh, make you play some sounds and talk about it a little bit. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, that was my first sound, I've called that Dunton Green, which is the village I come from. Um, that's kind of like my first sort of um, proper hands-on analog synth was an SH-09. Um, I had, what did I have before? What did we have? Poly 800, didn't we? Um, which sounds right, but it's, it's a bugger to program, really. And um, so the SH-09, this is the kind of, this is the kind of sound that I was always trying to get out of. So that's a basic starting point, you know. That's kind of like press. That would be my kind of writing bass sound. Um, or, you know, sometimes you know, lead, sort of rhythm pieces as well, high up. You know, it's kind of a real bread and butter kind of sound for me, really. Um, spawned from my sort of early time with analog synths in Dunton Green. Very cool. Well, um, Phil, if you can throw in on a, uh, a sound and maybe some inspiration behind it. Uh, the inspiration behind this one is. And if you, if you need to tweak it, of course, we've just turned these on, so they may not be exactly as you left them. Bob Cow, basically. Like, because uh, Bob is like 808, really, when it's written in digital. Order. So it's a bit like the 808 count. But, uh, Sounds or so, 
and then emailing them to me, I would put them together into one bank and, you know, of the names aren't right, we had to rename them and copy and paste them together. And so the first time that we actually had all of these sounds together in one place uh, to where we could compare them in person was not more than an hour ago, I don't think. <laughs> So uh, we, were, we were filming a little get-together, a little jam session in the Moog studio, and, you know, I'd have to run upstairs and get uh, Paul's more recent email that had the more recent batch of presets because I'd loaded the wrong ones in. And so even still, we're at a point where we're doing a little bit of live programming. But, uh, and looks and right. sweet work with them, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we try to make it a little bit easier, but some, some of that unpredictable life that we, that we love and extol can, um, you know, it's one of those things where it is good to work things out a little bit beforehand. Uh, and that's a good way to segue into one of the other things I wanted to talk about, which was sort of the experience of working with these instruments, and especially some of the quirkier, older uh, instruments, you know, back in the early 90s when, um, you know, people were using the cast-offs of the late 80s in a new musical context, and sometimes trying to do this live in front of a few tens of thousands of people, and maybe it went according to plan, maybe it didn't. Uh, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that, about, um, you know, so the sort of things I'm interested in are what sort of gear was it that you were bringing to your, your early shows? Well, I, I can, the first thing I would say is at the end of the town that I grew up in, I, I managed to buy a Jupiter 6 with a flight case, customised in two outputs of 200 pounds. Um, <laughs> so jealous. And the guy was really ripping me off. Um, but that, that, we used to take that everywhere with us, and um, that used to have sort of, it basically, it just used to go wrong every now and then. It would mostly stay in tune, but then every now and then it would just be like doing random arpeggiation, all out of time, just playing rock, as if like someone was saying, going like that, and you people. And it, it just it used to happen with gigs quite often, didn't it? And um, it was just one of those things, you just used to have to stop, but I apologise, turn the thing on and off, and just go. <laughs> Not now. And then, uh, you know, you just have kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of thing, you know, it's, it still happens now with analog synths. They just go, they just go wrong sometimes. I have to say, the Slim Fatty, because we use Slim Fatty and uh, Voyager um, live on stage, and they're two that don't ever go wrong. I have to, I have really to say, you know, <laughs> They, they don't go wrong, you know, they are, they are very good um, on, on that front. Fantastic. It's my Macbeth that sort of has been going wrong with. Oh, can it? No. No, no, it has. It's been going on sort of ring modulator and, um, and FM. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, no, no. Right. You, don't, you, you don't want to get them rained on. It's no, not, no, it says right in the manual somewhere, you're not supposed to. <laughs> yeah, so we, we got ours actually soaked um, in... In Poland, in Poland. Yeah. we would all set up on stage, beautiful festival, absolutely beautiful sort of summer's evening, 20 minutes till we were going on, and then this amazing wind came up and everybody had to get out of the sort of backstage tents and everything, it just felt like everything was going to tear over, <coughs> then it just started thundering and lightning and rain came down, everybody had to evacuate the stage because it was all wobbling, and our equipment <laughs> was just sat there like a pee on a drum, just getting <laughs> completely <laughs> Two pints of water came out of it at the end. Um, we, we got one moment we could run on stage. I ran off a, a laptop, a soaking wet laptop over each arm. So, 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 I don't know why I saved the laptop. So I don't, I don't know why. I think it's the information in there. That right, right. But um, no, we, spent that, you know, we took everything apart, um, trying to dry it over these big, massive heaters, weren't we? Yeah, and then the next dryers, day, so. hair dryers, literally all the circuit boards out. Right. Yeah, we went to um, the Czech Republic. And um, no, Slovakia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happened in the Czech Republic. Yeah, I don't I want to blame Poland. Yeah, literally, we had them opened up. I was sat sort of somewhere trying to reprogram the set on SoftSense in case we couldn't get anything working, and he was sat sort of pretty much in his pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't remember why, but it was, sort of like the hair dry, to, it was boiling hot, just trying to dry everything, and we just about got it all going. Um, it's quite that sarong, didn't we? It's called a sarong. A sarong. <laughs> <laughs> um, and pretty much, and then slowly over over the next sort of month or so, the gear started to sort of degrade, didn't it? Um, and we had to actually get get Ken Macbeth's last um, M5 
and often he said it's the last one in the shop. Oh. It's going to be expensive. Was what, that was his words. But, well, he had you over a barrel, then, didn't he? Yeah, he certainly did. Yeah. Well, the insurance company, anyway. Um, right. But, oh, I'm going to insurance that for your oh, story. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But, it's going to be expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that was our adventures with analog synths and water. <laughs> so in the in a in a better scenario where you know the skies haven't opened up and and you know calamity isn't striking, um, you know what what's your your approach generally for integrating a, sh a, a show? Like, what's the master? What's in charge? How much is just um, like literally played? You know, musicians playing live, and how much is under the direction of? you know, a sequencer or a computer, or what's, what's, what's your balance for, for that? For what we do, we, we have Ableton just running clips, I have all the songs, sort of, you know, all the parts for all the songs there in one thing, so I don't have to think about loading computers, and the laptop sits to one side, so I, I can't bear looking at a laptop live. Mm -hmm. um, but then I've got a custom version of Grid, the software, which is basically gives you sort of like a touch surface, which is a mirror of Ableton, um, lay out nicer, but I've got it on three, three of them, um, so I can have 24 across by 11 down, I think. Um, basically, just um, jam with that, improvising the, the structure of the songs. Um, since we have analog synths for pretty much most of the synth parts, um, and then we use loops or you know samplers within the computer for, for digital stuff, for samples and um, break beats and you know anything. So, so a lot of those clips are MIDI, they're running out to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything that's like synth-based, we, we do MIDI and run out to the sort of Voyager, this, you know, on a big, full sort of setup. It might be a Macbeth, um, a Sun Sim, and a Jupiter 6 as well. You know, um, you, you've mentioned actually a number of exceptionally temperamental items. The Sun Sim does not have a sterling reputation for reliability. It doesn't, no, but it's all right, actually. It's so far, so good. Although it does... It, it does have a little game you play if you sort of twist two knobs at the same time and kind of says, no, can't do that, and then just start swapping the, the, kind of, the, the information between them. So you kind of have to go one knob at a time on the sun scene. But it does sound exceptional. You know? Oh, absolutely. Um, but it is, yeah, it's not the happiest camper. It does stay in tune, though, generally. Very good. Well, Chad, let me ask you a little bit about, you've got a live, uh, a live act that you're doing right now, Missile Command. Uh, how long